We're going to stand together on May 1st. Um, we're going to um, come together and we're going to protest. Uh, we don't want to we, we don't want to do this. You know, we're being forced to do this. We're not protected. We're not paid correctly, um, meaning there is no sick time leave or pay sick time or hazard pay. Welcome to The Real News, I'm Jessel Noor. There's no crisis the powerful won't exploit, and despite the enormous challenges, workers are continuing to organize and fight back, and have called for a general strike on May 1st. As the staggering death toll from the coronavirus pandemic continues to grow, and working people are not only facing the health impacts, but economic devastation as well. An unemployment rate unmatched since the Great Depression, with at least one in seven workers now seeking jobless benefits. Half of those have been unable to secure assistance, according to a survey by the Economic Policy Institute. Millions unable to pay rent or mortgages with no assistance in sight. And governors seeking to reopen their economies against the advice of public health experts and threatening to punish workers who refuse to return to work. Well, now joining us to discuss this is a top labor reporter who was on the beat before it was cool. Sarah Jaffe is a reporting fellow at the Tight Media Center and the author of Necessary Trouble, Americans and Revolt, and the forthcoming Work Won't Love You Back. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So workers are facing unprecedented challenges. There's record unemployment numbers. And many of those who who have work, especially low-income people of color, have to work in dangerous conditions. Um, What are you hearing right now? I'm hearing from workers who are scared, who are mad, who are you know, laid off and struggling to figure out how they're going to pay the bills and who are going to work in terrible conditions. And some of them are actually winning some concessions from the boss. And yeah, so can you talk about what that, what that looks like? It looks like a lot of different things right now. You know, we're in this moment where a lot of the traditional organizing tactics don't work so much because, you know, people who actually respect the lockdown, which I'm sure we'll get to that point later, um, are trying to stay apart from one another. So things like normal mass protests don't look the same anymore. However, what we've learned is that it's really, really striking to see sort of perfectly socially distanced actions from workers ranging from nurses who are demanding more personal protective equipment to the workers at GE plants who are demanding to make more personal protective equipment. And of course, the strike still works. And, um, yeah, and and you know those those GE workers you talked about are really mm-hmm. striking because they yeah. were demanding their workers create protective gear. I'm uh, sorry, their yeah. owners, you know, yeah. the, the the factories could take, uh, create protective gear. Something Trump has the power to do. Something he's used, mm-hmm. you know, to to help create his wall. Um, and now he's ordered um, to the reopening of meat processing right. facilities, which have been hotbeds for the coronavirus pandemic because it's you know similar to other workplaces, it's impossible to socially yeah. distance. Um, but he hasn't used that same power to, you know, which is something that nurses have been demanding for for mm-hmm. weeks and months now to yeah. use PPE. Can you, t- can you talk more about that? Yeah, exactly. So we've seen healthcare workers com- um, calling over and over again for the government to use the Defense Production Act, which allows them to basically requisition production um, to create protective equipment, to create ventilators, to create other sorts of healthcare things that would actually save lives during this crisis. And they've done that a little bit by now, like Trump has used it in limited capacity and mostly as an article I was reading this morning said, for places that were already doing it. So we're seeing the the calls coming from workers over and over again to use this. And instead, after the CEO of Tyson Foods took out, I guess, a full page ad in the New York Times, suddenly Trump is mandating under the Defense Production Act that meat processing plants where there have been documented outbreaks of the virus. I mean, we should really stress that. These are places that already are spreading the virus and they're spreading it to the workers. But, you know, I mean, there's a long history of us being quite aware that, you know, that the conditions in meat packing plants in particular, going back to Upton Sinclair, that affects the cleanliness of the food we eat. I don't know if y'all want to be ordering, you know, some Tyson chicken with the side of coronavirus, but I sure don't. Um, And so that's what they're doing in that case is, is essentially, you know, demanding, forcing, pressuring workers back to work. In situations like that, strikes are forbidden, although once again, you can't actually stop people from striking. You can fire them for it, but you can't really force them to go into work unless they're in prison, which is a whole other situation that we could talk about for probably years in this in this crisis. So to see where the government's priorities are, it's essentially, you know, keeping 
mm, certain corporations profitable rather than making sure that we have the actual life-saving equipment that people, including if we wanted to keep those meat processing workers safe, those workers, uh, the equipment that they would need. And just the level of profits that some of these, you know, big CEOs are seeing, oh, yeah. it's just truly astounding. I think Jeff Bezos, you know, he's already earned an ex something like an extra $18 billion since this crisis started. Um, and, yeah. and so these are the, and so the workers we're talking about are the people that works often work for these big CEOs. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, um, you know, it's just, it's just striking to see how little has been done to hold these big corporations accountable. You know, they've been given a blank check from this uh, from the stimulus up to six trillion dollars with, you know, few, if any, strings attached. Yet working people have, you know, gotten a pittance from this. Um, yeah. Talk about, you know, there's mounting pressure now on Democrats to actually, you know, get some concessions for working people, which are supposed to be their base. These are the people that are going to need to show up um, in November to, if, if Democrats are going to take back the White House and the Senate. If we're going to have an election. Well, yeah. that's a whole other story, too. Um, yeah, I mean, when we're talking about Jeff Bezos, right? Jeff Bezos owns Amazon, which owns Whole Foods, which are two of the companies where workers are calling for strikes on Friday. Um, I don't know, you know how big those strikes are going to be because this organizing is all really new and mostly, again, taking place in sort of unprecedented Way. So we're thinking, we're looking at organizing that's happening online, on Zoom calls, on Facebook groups, which is not, you know, it's not brand new, but it is, has been something that has both been used sort of dramatically in the case of like worker organizing at Walmart over the last several years, but also, you know, sometimes with limited success. Still, though, we've seen workers walk out at Amazon factory, or not factories, excuse me, Amazon doesn't factory, um, warehouses, distribution centers, not just in this country, but in France. Um, my friend Cole Stangler, who's now reporting from France, had a piece today in the New York Times about the way that they've managed to bring Amazon to the table in France. Now, of course, in, in France and other European countries, they have what's called sectoral bargaining, which means the companies are sort of forced by the government to deal with the workers' representatives. That we don't have here, we could have here. We've had sort of something similar to it at some point, and it might be something that, you know, if the Democrats cared about working people thinking about ways to implement it, um, might be a good idea. I, you know, again, we, and the I election think, alone for now, but yeah, and I'm glad you brought up France because from what I read in France, mm -hmm. Amazon has been ordered to stop shipping non-essential goods, which yeah. is, seems like a common sense, you mm -hmm. know, a demand right now. Um, but we haven't heard. I mean, so that's something that's happened in France, and I think courts were involved in that as well. Yeah. But um, those type of basic, you know, those types of common sense, basic demands, um, you're hearing from yeah. the workers, but not really right. hearing from that many elected officials, and. Um, Something we were talking about off camera is how the press has given far more attention to these reopen mm -hmm. protests, which we know are backed by the dark money of the Coke Donor Network, um, and at, um, you know demanding to reopen the economy um, when public health work, health experts are saying this is going to cause new outbreaks, mm -hmm. and we're already seeing that in places in Tennessee where there's been outbreaks after these protests have happened. Um, yeah. Talk about what we know about who's behind these, and you know, and was, now there's governors saying if workers don't return to work they're going to get punished as well. Yeah, I think there's a few important things to sort of unpack here. One, of course, is that our unemployment system, as you mentioned, is designed to make sure people work. So you don't get unemployment normally if you quit. You don't get unemployment normally if you're fired for cause. You get unemployment if you were laid off through no fault of your own. They've loosened that a little bit depending on the state with the coronavirus unemployment passage, the pa package that was passed through Congress. But it's still quite difficult to get unemployment. As you mentioned at the beginning, only about half the people who have been laid off have been able to access it. And that's before these states like, you know, Georgia um, are trying to reopen, right? They're trying to, and what, what that means is that workers are no longer considered um, doing the right thing if they stay home. Suddenly they're supposed to go back to work and they can get kicked off of those unemployment benefits if they do not go to work, take the first job that is offered, all of that stuff. Um, the other thing about these protests, right, is that sort of like the Tea Party, right? This was, you know, the during the financial crisis, um, the resulting recession in 2008, 2009, the first big protests that we seemed to see were coming from the right. And it was backed by the same kinds of people that we, you know, as far as we know, are backing these protests now. And it is, you know, it's sort of all wrapped up in this idea of freedom being you can buy whatever you want. 
um, which is a particularly American definition of freedom. And one that, as you mentioned, the workers at places like Amazon and Walmart are saying like, please don't shop for unnecessary things right now. Um, and the other thing about that definition of freedom is that it is, as, as uh, historian Greg Grandin put it in his recent book, The End of the Myth, which is some great coronavirus reading if you're bored right now, um, he argues that Americans' understanding of freedom is sort of this understanding of, of not being restrained in what we do, and that that kind of lack of restraint has often been like meant the freedom to oppress other people. So when you look at somebody holding up a sign that says, I want a haircut, you know, or why can't I buy X, Y, Z thing? What they're demanding is that somebody else has to go to work in order to do what they want to be done. They are still sort of demanding the freedom to oppress other people. And what we know from the statistics on the essential workers who are currently working and the service industry more broadly is that the people who will be forced back into these unsafe conditions are largely black and brown. A lot of them are immigrants and a lot of them are women. And finally, um you know, you've been following the labor movement, uh, organized labor for um, some time now. Um, where does organized labor stand in this moment? Have they, have you been encouraged by some of the actions they're taking? Or is that, or are they also in a really difficult space um, without a lot of political power at this point? Yeah, I mean, nobody, I think, would have said that the American labor movement was in a strong place at the beginning of 2020, right? There are some bright spots, the teachers organizing that has been going on for, you know, the last decade um, that sort of first popped up in places like Chicago. That has been a really exciting bright spot for the labor movement. Um, the fact that the public sector unions didn't completely collapse after the Janus decision that was just about a year ago, that has been a really good sign. But it is also true that like a lot of the workers who have been laid off belonged to service sector unions. Those unions are in a rough place right now. Um, some of that is being outweighed by some of their members then being essential workers, like the United Food and Commercial Workers represents a lot of grocery store workers and they have done things like get them hazard pay, which is great, right? You get hazard pay, you can bargain some degree of protective equipment. Again, if you can get your hands on it, um, you can bargain sort of safety precautions in the stores, limited amount of people allowed in, things like that. Um, and then, of course, the thing that's happening now is just that like the calculus of going to work at a kind of lousy job um, used to be like, well, it kind of sucks and it doesn't pay me enough, but it's something, it's better than nothing. Um, I can get another job later. Now, when that kind of lousy job that was maybe okay is also possibly gonna get you very sick or kill you, that's a totally different set of calculations that people have to make. And, you know, when you work at like, say the Smithfield plant in South Dakota that had hundreds of workers sick, and then Trump says, you know, you gotta go to work. Are you gonna go to work? What's that gonna look like? Are you willing to go to that job? And Who's going to be willing to take those jobs if the current crop of workers will, A, you know, hundreds of them are sick, but B, they just stop doing it. And so there's a potential moment for a lot of power for working people right now. It's also a really, really dangerous time where a lot of people are unemployed. And so the labor movement, if it is smart, should be thinking about also how you organize among the unemployed, how we think about and talk about work and the lack of it in a global pandemic, all of these things that, that are, you know, we have some understanding of how to talk about, but not in this particular context. And so that's something we all could be doing with our lockdown. Well, we know the, the wealthy, the powerful are exploiting this crisis and, um, you mm -hmm. know, the working people have to organize as well. Uh, Sarah Jaffe, thanks so much for joining us. Reporting fellow at the Tight Media Center, author of Necessary Trouble, Americans in Revolt, and the forthcoming Work Won't Love You Back. Thanks so much. Thank you. And thank you for joining us at The Real News Network.